Good afternoon, everyone. I think it's time to start. There are a lot of people online, and we're expecting quite a few more, actually. I'll try to keep this to about an hour. Um, this webinar, of course, is about PDF Toolbox 7. In terms of new functionality, uh, what you see on the slide on my screen is uh, are, are a couple of the main new features if you want. I'll go over all of those and I also have a list of smaller items I want to mention during this webinar. So um, I will try to not use this presentation uh, too much and uh, instead show as much as possible actual software both, of course, of uh, PDF Toolbox 7 desktop and of the, uh, the server version. They are all available. The command line versions on all platforms are all available for download uh, as well. So if I launch uh, PDF Toolbox 7, the first thing I want to talk about is uh, what we call a, a checkpoint which is actually a way to enable manual operations, manual uh, inspection and manual fixing in uh, an automated workflow. As you know, with PDF Toolbox 6, we uh, introduced the possibility to um, launch a server and manage a server from within the desktop. And I can either launch a server on my local machine, which I have done here for this demo, or I could connect to a remote server running on a different machine. But that functionality to configure the, uh, the server has been there since PDF Toolbox 6. What you could not do is um, get a notification of files that there are problems with and uh, solve those problems in those files uh, that the server uh, processed. And PDF Toolbox 7, what was introduced is something called a checkpoint that allows you to do exactly that. So I have configured here a, a local PDF Toolbox server. On that server, I have two jobs. And what I'm going to do is show you the configuration of the first job I have on there. And what you'll see right away is that the, uh, the panel where you can configure a job has been uh, reworked, if you want, to allow the, the additional options that you, uh, that you have. And you can see a list here of all of the different folders, all of the different conditions for uh, output, success, info, warning, and error. And if I click on each of those, you can see that I can now configure a report to be generated for that particular condition. So here I say, when everything is successful, I don't want to get a, uh, a report. On info, on warning, and on error, I have set that to PDF report, and I have checked send to checkpoint. Not only that, I've also given that checkpoint a name, check adds, and that gives me a job that will process files. And if a file generates uh, an informational message, a warning, or an error message, then uh, that file will be kept in a checkpoint. Now, what can I do with checkpoints? Let me close the server window here. Back in uh, PDF Toolbox desktop, I go to Tools. Not only do I now have this server menu item, as I had in uh, version 6, I also have a new item that is called Server Checkpoint Files. And that is a window where I can see which files are waiting in a, uh, in a checkpoint. Now, what I uh, will have to do is throw something in the hot folder that I have here. So I have a check add hot folder number of files. I'll just copy those into the input folder. And uh, they will be picked up by a PDF Toolbox server. That takes just a second to do that. And the idea, of course, is that the server still does its automatic processing. It finds uh, warning messages or error messages in some of the files that it processes. 
And what you can see on my screen is that this checkpoint window that I have open in PDF Toolbox uh, desktop is receiving those files that there are problems with. Of course, the desktop doesn't have to run on the same machine as the server. I could perfectly well connect to a remote server running uh, somewhere else, or somewhere in the basement in the server room, and I would still get uh, in this list the files that cause problems. I can go to one of these files and I have a little uh, info icon here. If I click that, it opens up an info window with a whole bunch of information about that particular file and there is a, a preview area where I can see that actual file and where I can also uh, even uh, view the report that was generated for that particular file. But better than that, I can go back to the info pane here and I can say uh, check out. What that means is that that file is automatically downloaded from the server into my uh, desktop. I can now use the different tools I have available in PDF Toolbox desktop to uh, inspect this file uh, further. I could use some of the visualize tools to look at ink coverage, for example, or examine, sep uh, examine uh, separations. I could also use uh, some of the tools in the switchboard, run a profile, change the file even. Uh, so I could go to, just as an example, I could bring up the switchboard, go to colors, convert that to uh, black and white, or run whatever profile uh, I want to run to fix the problems that were found during uh, pre-flight. And once I've done that, I can check that file uh, back in to the server. And when I'm checking in, I'm moving this modified file back to the, uh, to the server. It will also allow me to choose what the condition is, the output condition for that particular document. So if I think that I have fixed the, uh, the file, then I can move it to a success out. If I think there are still problems and uh, they need to be corrected, then I could move it to an error uh, out. Let me do that once more. I can check out a file into PDF Toolbox. And once I am ready, I can go here and uh, check that, that uh, in again. And uh, when I'm doing that check-in, I can choose what the result should be for that particular document. If this one is not fixable, I would set it to error, select check-in, and that file would end up in the, see if we can bring that up here, that file will end up in the error output for a PDF uh, toolbox server. So the automated workflow still works as before. I have files that I can drop into an input folder. They are processed with the configuration I have set up for that particular job on the server. And if I configure it that way, they are held by the uh, checkpoints. After I decide what needs to happen to that particular document, it is still either moved into warning, success, or error folder, depending on the choice that I have made there. And as you can see, this file has actually been converted to uh, grayscale, as I did in the uh, desktop version. The second file we checked out was, in fact, moved to the output folder. Now, um, this works with PDF Toolbox desktop and uh, PDF Toolbox server. One of the other things that is new here is that you can also use the, uh, the plugin in Acrobat to do uh, similar uh, things. This was not available in version 6, but is available in, uh, in version 7. Uh, in version 6, you had to use PDF Toolbox desktop, the standalone version, to manage a server. The server and the server checkpoint file menu item are now also found in the plugin inside of Acrobat. So if you prefer 
to do the configuration from within Acrobat, or if you prefer to check out files into Acrobat to examine them and fix them, then you can do uh, exactly that. This will even work uh, in, um, in Switch. If I have a, uh, a setup in, uh, in Switch, then there will be, and that is not available yet, but it will be available. And let me just go back to the uh, presentation to, um, to show you how that will look like. There will be an additional configurator for PDF Toolbox 7 called PDF Toolbox 7 Checkpoint that will allow you to do that communication with the server and uh, receive in one of the uh, output folders of the configurator, receive the file once an operator uh, handled it using the checkpoint in the desktop version. So uh, in, in short, uh, you have an automated workflow set up with um, PDF Toolbox Server. In version 7, you can uh, quarantine, if you want, those files that cause problems in a checkpoint. Those checkpoints can be given a name so that you know uh, which uh, job in PDF Toolbox Server uh, generated those files. And in PDF Toolbox Desktop, I now have a new window to look at those files, check them out, work with them, change them if I want to, and check them into the server workflow again. Of course, the checkout and check-in are implemented in, uh, in that way because uh, that avoids that two operators will uh, start to work with a, a file at the same time. If I check a file out, then it is uh, locked for other operators to, uh, to check it out. Um, let me see if there, is, uh, if there are any specific questions about this um, that, uh, that I can answer right now. So will this be com compatible with Infocus Switch? Yes, that's what I mentioned uh, with the uh, configurators. There will be a configurator for Infocus Switch that handles these checkpoints. There are actually already configurators for version 7 um, available uh, from within Switch. You just have to go to Manage Configurators and uh, download those from within Switch. The Checkpoint Configurator is not ready yet. You'll see that appear in uh, a couple of weeks. If you have an interest in trying that or being, being notified when it is ready, simply drop us an email and uh, we will be happy to um, we will be happy to, 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 to notify you or see if we can get you a, a beta version at some point. So that's the first new feature, the integration of the, uh, the checkpoint in uh, PDF Toolbox Desktop. And along the way, I have actually already kind of given away uh, the second new feature, which has to do with uh, reports. Um, as you know, um, there are a number of different report formats that you can uh, that you can generate with uh, PDF Toolbox. You have a, an annotation report, a layer report, a masking report, and then you have XML and uh, text and HTML based versions. However, these reports have always been static. You were not able to change the way they, uh, they looked. You were not able to include some of your own uh, information or your client information, and that has been changed in PDF Toolbox 7 uh, as well. And you've already seen uh, kind of a preview of how that report looks. There is a new report type in PDF Toolbox 7, and uh, as you can see, it looks a lot more uh, a, a lot more user friendly, and it's a lot easier to see the information that is uh, that is presented. We've tried to make it a lot more graphically pleasing, but also to make it very compact so that people find their uh, their way and, and get the information that they need to see very easily. The coolest thing about this is that this report is generated using a new engine. Um, that engine is available already today in PDF Toolbox Server. Uh, today it's only used to uh, generate these reports. In the future, there will be a lot more that you can do with this. But this is an engine that takes HTML plus CSS plus JavaScript 
and converts that into a PDF file on the fly. So what basically happens is that you have in PDF Toolbox, you have a, a definition, you have an HTML file folder with HTML file with CSS in it and with uh, JavaScript in it. And um, that combination of HTML uh, and CSS is converted into the PDF report. And what is really nice about this, of course, is that you can modify this uh, template to look and feel slightly different if you want to present different information to your uh, customer. And um, well, what you can see here is a, a screen grab of how the original looks like with some uh, images for uh, for Kalas in it, and then you have some other images in it. You can actually do two things here. You can look at where the reports are installed, and you can see the path to that uh, folder right at the bottom of the, uh, the slide here. You can go to where that uh, template is, uh, is installed on your machine and modify that. Or if you're using the command line version of PDF Toolbox, you can use a command line uh, uh, parameter here, a new one, to um, modify which report should be generated. And uh, it's very easy to, uh, to talk about, but I wanted to uh, be a little bit more daring than that and show you how that works. So what I'm going to do is switch to a uh, terminal window. This is always exciting during a demo. I'm going to take PDF Toolbox uh, 7, the CLI version in my case. You could actually do the same kind of modification using PDF Toolbox Server if you want, because a job in PDF Toolbox Server also allows you to specify additional command line parameters. So this functionality that I'm showing here is also available uh, if you use a server. What I'm going to do is specify that I want a particular type of report generated, and that's the template report. This is the name for this new uh, reporting format. And instead of using the default template, I have prepared uh, a slightly modified template here. And then what I need is a pre-flight profile and a file that I want to uh, process. So a very simple command line. Basically, I'm uh, asking PDF Toolbox to process a PDF file using the profile that I specified and then uh, also with the uh, report templates uh, that, I, uh, that I modified. And it's going through the, uh, the motions of doing the actual pre-flight. There is nothing new to, uh, to that. But in the end, it now generates a, uh, a report for me. And if everything goes well, then that should be the uh, report that it, uh, that it generated. As you can see, I've done only minor modifications in this example, but this gives you an idea of what the, uh, the possibilities are. Um, I changed some of the, uh, the images that are used in this report. I changed the, uh, the color of the, the, the lines that are used around some of these sections. I also changed some of the text. And where it previously said report generated by uh, Kala's PDF toolbox, I inserted a different name, a different version number, just to show you that uh, this allows you to modify not only the look and feel, but also to a certain extent what text, what communication will be provided to your client. So either you simply use the new report format as it is provided by PDF Toolbox 7, and that should already be a lot more clear than the, uh, the old or the, the, the version 6 uh, report, or you can go one step uh, beyond that and also modify the, the report template to include some of your uh, artwork, uh, maybe the name of your company, uh, or even much more radically change the, uh, the information that is presented. As I said in the beginning, and you see it noticed here on the report as well, uh, some of the information that you have in this report is actually generated uh, using JavaScript. So this makes it a very flexible mechanism to uh, provide exactly the type of report that you, uh, that you want. 
So let me uh, put that away again. Uh, let me see if there are any uh, questions available for um, for this that I can answer right away. So uh, different languages, yes, the the, uh, the reports will also be localized into different languages just as the rest of um, PDF Toolbox is. Uh, there should also not be a problem to generate uh, special characters like uh, the exam the question I got here was for uh, for French. Uh, normally PDF Toolbox uh, supports Unicode throughout the application so we shouldn't run into any issues uh, with that either. Um, can the report be in HTML instead of a, a PDF file? You already have the ability today to generate an HTML report. And there is, uh, PDF Toolbox has always had the ability to generate an XML report. Um, and you can uh, append an XSLT to that to generate an HTML file if that is what you want to report to your, uh, to your customer. So um, after reporting, and um, I'll try to um, make it a little quick as I think I'm going to spend much more than an hour if I'm not careful. One of the questions that got asked quite a bit is, um, and then the workflow where that is necessary uh, depends. There are different reasons why you would want to do that. But one of the common requests that we got was, is it possible to view um, page boxes, trim box, bleed box, on a permanent uh, basis? Now, what you can do is you can go to preferences. And in the preferences, you have a way of uh, highlighting page boxes in the actual uh, document, show page box. Uh, here, but that is something that is only switched on for display. You cannot save a version of the PDF file with that page box highlighted in it. And sometimes people want to generate a PDF where they can show their clients where the trim box is going to be, for example. One of the new features in um, PDF Toolbox 7 is to allow exactly that. I have a profile here. I'm simply going to run that on uh, my document. Uh, this particular profile was created so that um, if there is an object that comes too close to the, um, let me just select results here and get that started. When there is an object that comes too close to the trim box, and you can see on this page on the left-hand side, there is this, this background curve that comes very close to the, uh, to the trim box and doesn't extend all the way to, uh, the, uh, to the bleed box. Well, this, this profile was configured in such a way that if there are objects on the page that come close to the trim box, that the trim box is outlined using a green line in this particular example. And Actually, if we go back to this uh, pre-flight uh, report, there is a fix-up in there. And if I open up that uh, fix-up, you'll see that I can choose which box should be colored. Um, I can choose to put that information in as a spot color. And I can actually also uh, put that uh, trim box on the layer. If we go back to um, the document for a second, and I would go to explore layers for this document, then you can see that there was a layer added called trim box, and that gr green outline that is drawn on top of the trim box is actually contained on that layer. So you can visualize it, you can show it to a uh, to a client, uh, or show it at some at some point in the workflow where it's important to see this. But if you don't need it anymore, it is as simple as switching off that layer and it's, uh, it's invisible again. Now, the profile that was used here is, uh, was configured, like I said, in such a way to only add a trim box if there are objects that come close to the trim box. So the second page in this document didn't get that trim box uh, overlay added. Right. So, um, 
a very easy way of uh, actually adding information on top of a uh, on top of the trim box or the bleed box or the uh, the art box and highlight it. Okay. Next. Um, this is actually something that I will not show you in PDF Toolbox itself, but I do want to show you a slide about it and uh, give you some background on one other big change, or actually two other big changes in PDF Toolbox 7. Uh, as you know, PDF Toolbox uses and has used for years uh, the Adobe PDF library to do a variety of tasks. Um, with PDF Toolbox 7, you have a new version of the Adobe PDF library included in PDF Toolbox. And one of the nice things about that is that the transparency flattening uh, results that you get with this new library are much better than what you had in PDF Toolbox 6. So what you're seeing here is a side-by-side -side of the transparency flattening results in Toolbox 6 and Toolbox 7. Uh, generated at the same resolution, the file uh, the file sizes will not significantly uh, differ in PDF Toolbox 7, but the quality of the transparency flattening is much better in PDF Toolbox uh, 7, and that's quite uh, quite important. And I'll actually add something in the next point about this library, but before we go there, uh, this is not the only new library in PDF Toolbox 7. The other thing that happened was that the font library that PDF Toolbox uses, and this is a Kalas uh, library, that that font library uh, is totally renewed as well. If we look at the difficult files that we get in, uh, in support, uh, the, the files that, that, that people really struggle with in their workflows, in many cases, uh, the problems are still generated by fonts, either corrupt fonts or fonts that are borderline following the rules, well, this new library that you have, this new font library that you have in PDF Toolbox 7 uh, resolves a, a lot of those issues that we've seen over the, the last couple of years as well. So that's important. It's not really a visual change, but remember that you have both a new um, Adobe PDF library included in PDF Toolbox 7 and a completely rewritten uh, font library, and both will give you a much higher quality while processing PDF files, and in many cases also improved performance while you process those files. Now, I do want to get back um, to that Adobe library for a second. Uh, one of the uh, one of the things that we also got uh, asked for uh, quite a lot. It has to do with overprint. Uh, the Adobe PDF library is good at flattening uh, transparencies. Now, uh, this particular document that 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 I have here um, doesn't have any uh, any transparencies. It only has uh, objects that are put in uh, in overprint. And uh, let me see if I can uh, make that uh, make that clear. If I run a, uh, a check that uh, shows me all of the vector objects, the filled vector objects on this, um, on this page, then um, I can just uh, run over those. And what you can see is that I have, in total, there are uh, six circles in this document. Um, the three on the right-hand side here are put in, uh, in overprint. Now, if I look at this file uh, using a viewer that doesn't do overprint preview, uh, let's say that I look at it on, a, uh, on an iPad, for example, then the result is not going to be what I expect because the overprint is not going to be visible. And it's very hard to find a good solution uh, for that. Now, what I can do in uh, PDF Toolbox 7, and I need to go back to uh, my, uh, my my pre-flight profiles for that is I can run a pre-flight profile here that will 
flatten these overprints. And this is functionality that you also find in um, in the new Adobe PDF library that is included in PDF Toolbox 7, uh, where let me go back to the check so that I can see uh, what happened here. There we go. Uh, you can already see that there are more objects on the page now. The three circles on the left are, of course, not uh, changed because there was no overprint in, the, in that case. The circles on the right are now broken up in individual pieces, and there is actually no longer any overprint used. So this particular PDF file, the way it is now, will render correctly uh, either in uh, a good a good PDF viewer, but also in PDF viewers that don't have overprint preview uh, switched on. Your choice whether you want to do this or not, but if you do have documents where uh, you want to flatten uh, overprint, then you can uh, then you can do that. So, close this down and uh, show you one case that we still cannot solve with the transparency flattener. This is a document, uh, and this is also something, unfortunately, that happens quite a lot. This is a document that contains spot color, um, and it has been transparency flattened. And that is a bit of a pity, because now if I try to convert that spot to CYK, so if I go to a profile where I convert spot to CYK and I have built a visual comparison check into that profile, we'll see what happens. I'm going to uh, save that again into my results folder. We'll take just a, uh, just a second. And what you uh, what you can see is that um, the document is processed, but I get a preflight error. Uh, the preflight error says that there is a visual difference between the original and the result. If I scroll to page three here, you can see uh, very easily why that is. Let me open up the uh, the original again and go to page three as well. Uh, this looks kind of uh, normal. Uh, however, the processed file. Uh, has these uh, dropped elements here, and this was caused by the fact that the file was transparency flattened, and that uh, changing the spot colors to CMYK afterwards causes uh, visual problems. What you want to do actually is do that conversion from spot to CMYK first, and then do transparency flattening. Now, we're kind of stuck here, of course, because the only thing we have is this file um, and um, this is what we have to work with. We can't go back to the original file in this case. Well, what you can do in uh, PDF Toolbox 7 is, and I've created a preflat profile for that here, is you can convert individual pages in a PDF file to an image. So you can basically, instead of doing that conversion uh, from spot to CNYK, what we're going to do here is convert this page, page number three, into a uh, into an image, and that resolves the uh, the issue. It's all. It's also almost the only thing you can do to resolve that particular issue. If I run that profile, uh, it has been created in such a way that I can specify which page needs to be uh, converted. So in this case, I want to convert page uh, three. That's the one that has this uh, these difficult elements on it. I'm going to do that and uh, again save that in uh, in results. There. And that will again take uh, take just a just a second. And what you can see is that uh, right now it doesn't appear there are many uh, differences that happened. However, if I zoom in, uh, you'll see that there is definitely pixelation going on uh, around the uh, the text. So this page has, in fact, been rasterized. Uh, it's been rasterized, in this case, at 400 dpi, so the quality is quite good. But this allows me to uh, work around the, um, 
to work around the problem of uh, the spot to CMYK conversion. I can simply flatten that page that would cause problems otherwise. Of course, this is not an ideal solution, but we often end up with files where you have to do uh, you have to do something, and uh, this allows me at least for this page to work around the issue that was caused by the file having been transparency flattened uh, before it came to us. So if you need a solution and the only solution is to do a conversion to an image, PDF Toolbox 7 will allow you to do that on a page-by-page -page basis. Moving on to another smaller issue, but one that was requested also quite uh, quite a bit. Um, in many files that you uh, that you find, there is uh, metadata that is included in it, and PDF Toolbox has a nice way of uh, visualizing that. I can go to Tools and uh, explore metadata. There is also a button on the switchboard that does the same thing. If I select that you can see uh, a list of all of the metadata that is included in a, uh, in a document. Now, what I can do in uh, PDF Toolbox 7 is run a pre-flight fix that uh, is called remove object level metadata and that will go through all of the elements in the PDF that can have metadata attached, XMP metadata attached, and remove that metadata from uh, the file. Now, in some cases, that has to do with file size, uh, but uh, not always. I'm going to show you one other example of why you might want to do that. This is a, a nice brochure for a nice Pentax um, uh, camera that uh, the guys from Kalas actually found on, uh, on the internet. Now, if I do the same thing as before and I uh, go to explore metadata, then it takes a while. And the reason it takes a while is because there are many different images in here that have metadata attached. This, what I'm looking at right now, is the, uh, the document level metadata. And you can see that they were very good at uh, making sure that that information was, uh, was correct. They have copyright information in here. It uh, has keywords and a description in here. However, if we go to an image that appears on one of the, uh, the later pages, and that image is uh, the, uh, the image that you have here on the right-hand side, you can see that the XMP information identifies the camera that was used to take that image with, and that happens to be a Canon EOS 10D. Now, it's kind of weird to have a Pentax brochure, marketing brochure, and have images in there that have been taken by a competitive uh, camera. So that was probably not the intention of whoever created that, that document. Unfortunately, when you create documents in InDesign or uh, Illustrator, it's often uh, very difficult to get rid of that metadata. InDesign preserves uh, information that was attached to anything that you place inside an InDesign document, uh, so you need to get, uh, you need to have a way to, uh, to get rid of that. And this new possibility in PDF Toolbox 7 to remove object level metadata does exactly that. So if I go to results and I save that in my results folder, it will uh, remove all of that information. And if I now go to explore metadata, we should see that the uh, images, of course, are uh, still there, and you still have the dimensions of the image and uh, bit depth and so on. This is the information that is always present in a PDF file and that you need to be able to display the image, but all of the XMP information that was attached to uh, these images has now been removed. The advantage, of course, that uh, you don't have that information in there that you uh, that you don't want to see. Um, but at the same time, also, and uh, I don't know if I can show that uh, well here. Uh, so you have an original document that was 5.7 megabytes, and if we look at the uh, uh, converted document, you can see that it is slightly smaller in this particular case. We have examples of documents, and this is quite important if you think about workflows where 
documents are used on an iPad, for example. We have examples of real-world documents where 60% uh, of the document size was actually metadata and not content. Um, if you are generating files for um, a, a mobile device, uh, as an example, then including this new fix is, uh, is actually going to give you quite a few uh, benefits. Uh, one of the questions here is, is it possible to remove the metadata for uh, Illustrator information? Uh, actually, uh, what Illustrator does is slightly different. Uh, it, uh, it saves XMP information, but uh, if you save a file as, uh, as PDF uh, from Illustrator, it also stores a whole bunch of uh, private data in the PDF file to be able to round trip it back into Illustrator if you ever want to do that. Uh, it has always been possible to remove that information. There is a fix up um, that you can use to remove private data from a PDF file, and that also removes that information that Illustrator adds to the um, to PDF files when it's uh, when it's done. So this is specific for um, XMP information. Now. Um, Next up is, uh, this is all about removing stuff. I, I noticed that we have three items uh, that, that, that talk about removing uh, things and they, they were all implemented because they come back in, uh, in many different uh, workflows. Um, what I have here is a, a document and I, I admit that it was created specifically to, um, to show this, this functionality, but still it's again is something that comes back in, uh, in many workflows. Uh, this is a document, a very simple document with a number of images in it, and the images were cropped. So you have a visible part, but there is a, uh, in fact, you have much larger images in this document that extend well beyond uh, what you can see in the document. And as a result, the document itself is also fairly, uh, fairly big. It's 88 megabytes in, uh, in this version. A request we often get is, can you uh, remove the information that is not visible, uh, also referred to as hard cropping of, uh, of images? And in PDF Toolbox uh, 7, uh, there is actually a way to, um, to do exactly that. I have created a or prepared a profile here called Remove Invisible uh, Image Parts. And if we run that on the document, uh, and again, I save that in results. We'll see what it does. This fix up allows you to do uh, two things. First of all, it will uh, hard crop the image. So remove everything that is not visible. And secondly, and you can see the result of that as well. Additionally, it is possible to also crop to a page box that you specify. And the profile I have here was, was set up in such a way that it removes everything outside of the bleed box. So those images that extended beyond the, uh, the bleed box have now also been clipped at the bleed box. If we go uh, have a look at the processed file, crop images that I have here is 88 megabytes. The processed document is slightly less than 20 megabytes. So in fact, all of that image data that was there but that could not be seen in the PDF has simply been removed. Like I said, also something that was implemented because it was uh, necessary in some cases. There were some workarounds in PDF Toolbox uh, to remove certain, uh, certain information, but hard cropping of images is something that was never possible with PDF Toolbox 7 that is now uh, available. And while we're uh, removing things, let's continue for a second. Uh, also something that was asked uh, a lot, uh, let me uh, take an example document here. Uh, this document has, um, it has some, uh, well not bounding box, but, but cut lines in them actually. And what we could uh, try to do is remove that. And in PDF Toolbox 6, there are uh, all kinds of workarounds with process plans and putting things on layers and then removing the layer or making it invisible. In PDF Toolbox 7, that has become a lot, uh, a lot easier. 
Uh, let me go to the switchboard and uh, under colors go to spot color. That shows me that this document contains a number of different uh, spot colors. If you've never used this, uh, this area of the, uh, the switchboard, uh, this basically allows you to manually change the spot color information you have in, uh, in a file. Now, what interests me here is that I have a spot color used for this die cut line that is um, called 106 print bleed. That's the information that I, uh, that I want. Um, and why do I want that? Well, I have prepared a um, pre-fight profile. And actually, I think it's one of the ones that is uh, included by default in here. So I have to go look for it. I should have put it in the... Uh, my special folder as well. It's actually right here. It's called remove all objects using spot color with specified name. So this is one of the default fix-ups that you'll find in PDF Toolbox 7. Of course, you can modify this to do exactly what you want. Uh, if I go look at what that uh, that does is, uh, well, it is a new fix-up that is called remove objects and that uses a pre-flight check to identify the objects that will be uh, removed. And in this case, I have uh, specified that um, all objects that use a spot color with a, a specific name have to be uh, removed. So if I do fix, it asks me, it's a variable uh, uh, fix, it asks me which Pantone color or spot color I'm interested in removing, and I'm going to use that 106 print bleed that we found. Again, it's changing the document, so let me save that somewhere else. And there we go. And now what it did was very simply remove that uh, specific spot color from the document. Like I said, there were kind of workarounds you had in PDF Toolbox 6 to accomplish this in, in some cases. PDF Toolbox 7 makes it much easier to simply remove a... Um, to remove elements out of uh, the file. And once again, the example here is with uh, objects with a specific spot color, but this is a generic fix-up that removes all objects identified by a particular pre-flight check. So uh, the only thing you have to do is make a pre-flight check that detects those objects that you want to remove, whether it's by spot color or because they are on a certain layer or because it's a certain type of object and you can simply uh, remove that from the, uh, from the document. Close that file and see what else we, uh, we have to do. Um, yes, one other um, possibility we have here is, uh, as you know, there is a compare functionality inside of, um, inside of uh, PDF Toolbox. That compare functionality has been there for, uh, for a while and it's based on the vis visualizer uh, engine uh, again. Um, normally, the, the compare functionality looks at all of the documents. So it will, uh, it will basically create an image of uh, the two documents and do a pixel-based comparison. What is annoying in some workflows is that you have documents that are largely the same, and this is actually quite a good example, but where there is, for example, one different separation uh, because there are different languages or different regional versions or so on. And what you might want to do is make sure that the background is the same, but that the you want to disregard the fact that the two documents that you're comparing have uh, different black text on them, for example. Well, the new compare engine in PDF Toolbox 7 is, allows you to compare um, individual channels. So I could say, for example, compare only the sign magenta yellow channels in this document. And as you can see, the text is now no longer highlighted. And that's, of course, because that text is uh, on the black plate. And I've selected not to... Um, not to generate that, uh, or not to compare that black text uh, on here. 
So um, if you want to compare documents where you only want to compare a certain separation or you want to exclude a certain separation from the comparison results, then in PDF Toolbox 7 you have the options to, uh, to actually do that. Close that, uh, close that down again. So, um, one last item in here, and this uh, this has to do with the with the packaging markets very specifically. Um, I have a uh, PDF file in here that uh, is a package. If I go back to my uh, my presentation for uh, for a second, and I go to the uh, to the end of the presentation, there is a new um, uh, European regulation that is um, going to come into effect probably around the start of 2015. We're never completely sure with regulations, but that's what is uh, predicted right now. And that regulation, one of the things in there, and there is a lot of information in there, but one of the things that uh, is important for packaging and uh, the, the, the checks you do, the quality checks you do on, uh, on packaging is the fact that text has to be easily uh, readable by consumers. And uh, because it's easy to, um, to, um, to do things that are not correct, they didn't want to specify that check using point size of uh, the characters on the package. Instead, they used something that is called X height. And as you might imagine, X height is actually the uh, size, the height of a uh, lowercase character X uh, as it appears in, uh, in the font. And there is a new pre-fly check. Uh, like I said, it's a little bit um, specific to packaging perhaps, but if you, uh, if you are in that workflow or uh, you're thinking of doing things in that area. It is a very important, uh, a very important case. Uh, there is a new pre-flight check, and let me just go to checks here and um, uh, open that up. So this is a check on the effective X height in uh, in millimeters, and I can specify uh, how that uh, should. Uh, uh, how big that should be. The regulation says it has to be 1.2 millimeters, but depending on the size of the package, if the package is small enough, then it can actually be uh, lower than that, if I'm not uh, mistaken. So um, this check allows you to comply uh, with that regulation or to do a check to make sure that your document complies with that regulation. And if I uh, perform the, uh, the check here, and I double click on what it finds. We can zoom in and see what that is. So it will find every instance of um, text where the X height of the used font is lower than um, what the regulation said. We set it to 1.2 millimeters in this case. So I can uh, go look at the, uh, the other things where it finds something. Uh, so this is here. Uh, and that's what it detects here is the uh, the little registered mark, uh, which probably would not be an issue under the uh, the regulation, but this check will find all of the cases where uh, you use a font at a that is lower than what the regulation uh, states. This is a very easy check to use. You simply put it in a preflight profile and you set what the minimum uh, size is. Uh, on a technical note, and that is perhaps good to know on a technical note or from a technical side, it is much more difficult to um, to implement. And the main reason for that is that um, that the uh, well, it, it checks the X height of a character in uh, in a font. Now the question is, uh, what do you do if that particular font in the document does not contain the letter X? Uh, other characters have slightly different shapes. If you have uh, characters that have a round shape, then the, the measurement has to be done 
slightly differently because there are all kinds of uh, visual kerning effects going on in fonts as well. So the bottom line is that the implementation of this check uh, in order to make sure that uh, it actually detects what it has to detect is, uh, is really, really difficult. And uh, this new uh, font library that I talked about in one of the previous items that you have in PDF Toolbox 7 um, is, is actually also uh, taking care of all of the, the difficult technical implementation details of that particular check. So if you want to use this or you need to use this, then it is available as of uh, PDF Toolbox 7, and you could simply include it in a, uh, in a pre-flight profile. Of course, the regulation says much more than simply uh, checking X height. This is just one tool that you can use in making sure that uh, packaging files comply with that regulation. So, and that uh, kind of concludes the, um, the things I wanted to, um, I wanted to show you today. Uh, it's a very quick overview, and I'm sure there are other uh, features in PDF Toolbox 7 that, um, that, that I didn't get to, uh, that I didn't get to talk about. Uh, but the, these are the most important ones. Uh, if you have any remaining questions, just drop us a note afterwards. Thank you very much for being here. Uh...